What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another edition of the Tuesday Track Talk, episode number 23 with your Three Stones Picker. I'm Cam. I'm your tire changer. I'm um, Kellen. I'm your Jackman. I'm your gas man, Cam. And we got another fantastic episode coming to you, coming off of a fantastic Atlanta race weekend where I think we probably got one of the greatest finishes we're going to see in quite a while. I mean, that's definitely, I think, in the top three as far as closest finishes for sure but i think as far as fantastic finishes go so we'll talk about that a little bit we'll talk a little bit about high limit uh and uh lucas oil at golden isles uh and take a little bit uh look ahead towards next weekend as well and all the racing going on there so what's going on fellas what you see is what you get yeah that <laughs> that it's nice that the weather's nice I actually went for a little walk tonight you know getting those creative juices flowing a little sure. bit so uh went for a 40 minute walk before we started recording so there you yeah. go I, I know uh, traveling for work today it got up to uh 73 in central illinois today it's 67 here yeah so. definitely so, can't complain about that in february but we're also we're supposed to hit like 32 in like two days yeah so <laughs> Gotta love the Midwest weather. And actually, for once, we didn't have any weather while we were in Atlanta this weekend. So we finally got some racing in on a Sunday uh, first time this year. So, um, no, weather was fantastic. And I think that proved to be some great racing. I think I heard Mike Joy also say that it was a full moon down there this weekend. So you know the havoc is going to be ramped up a little bit. And I think it really uh, showed with them wrecking on uh, lap two there in that race. Dude, we, we love racking right away in the race. We love racing from behind. Yeah. And, and you know, I we were talking during this race as well, and I, I think it was just a bad decision by Gill, and you can't check up in the straightaway. Well, that and that outside line just had so much energy. There was such a push coming from behind, and he yeah. got checked up, and Truex, unfortunately, was the pusher there, but he uh, he had nowhere to go. He checks up. He's the one that ends up wrecking the field. Like, yep. where, where do you take it, you know? Yeah, and it took out, you know, that sort of sort of the back half of the field and ruined a lot of guys' day right out of the gate without even really having a chance to do anything. So, um, no, so obviously that happened. But after that, it got pretty pretty calm. You didn't really have anything big happen. Um, you had pit road bit a couple of guys. I know I threw that in my race preview, uh, talking about the two different pit road speeds and that definitely bit a couple of guys. What's your thought on that? Having the two different pit road entries and speeds. I don't know. Well, the hard part is you have two different speeds, but then you also have the two different speed limits, depending on the caution and or the green. Yeah, because it's when it's under caution, it's forty. Was it forty five? It's forty five the entire way. It's forty five the entire way. So now you're also changing your marks of what bulbs are lit, what gear you're in, all that other stuff. So like, I mean, I, it adds another element. But there's when you talk about just pit road, there's a lot going on there. So I, I don't know. I, part of me likes it. Part of me wants to go back to just make it the entry cone on the end of pit road but i don't know it's also atlanta's a lot tighter than yeah. the big big daytona or talladega where they do it that way too so i don't know I, i'm in between on it cool but it's different enough that i'm like i i don't know i think you have to based on where pit road entry is for atlanta i mean it's you're not you're it's on. You can't pit slow road. down enough. Yeah, pit road entries on the back stretch. So, which leaves such a long ways. You got to go around the whole corner before you're on pit road. I liked it. Um, it, it, it just added a whole new element of mistakes. That one um, pit stop, Chastain just came way flying by <laughs> Keslowski. And nobody knew was Keslowski. Was he thinking it was yellow speed? Yep. Was Chastain going that fast? Well, <laughs> Chastain ended up getting a 
pit road speeding penalty out of it. But um, no, I like it. Um, again, it adds just another dynamic, uh, making sure, making these drivers um, be on it and men mentally in it. And then I think that just, that's another team aspect of it. I mean, everybody's got to be on the same page. You got to commun communication, all of it. I mean, it starts with the driver, but then your spotter's got to know, your crew chief, like everybody's got to know. And So yeah, a couple things. I was for it. A couple things on that. One, there was a wreck there with McDowell and Byron. And yep. I think Bush even kind of got tagged there a little bit. But – the interesting part of that, so when I was listening, I, I popped on Larson's scanner before the race started, and his spotter, when they were coming to check pit road speeds, his spotter asked him to tell him where the line is. Well, I suppose because he probably can't see it on the He on probably the can't stretch. see the line on the back stretch painted on the track. So when they went in, he said, can, can you give me the line? So that was a very interesting moment that I'm like, oh, so he actually – it was kind of a reference point of like Larson said here or now, and to kind of tell his spotter where that sure. line really was at. So that to me was very interesting, which when you're that far on the corner, whether it's buildings or the tower or the pylon or whatever it is inside of there, he even couldn't see the line himself. So add another element of calamity to that. Sure. That was a very interesting tidbit that I had caught as I was listening to the scanner before the race even started checking pit road speeds. Sure. One thing that I had kind of as a thought too, and I don't know how well this would work, but I think we're all curious for chaos too, is make it, make, keep the commitment line in turn three, but don't have a speed, a uh, speed limiter going around the corner. You have to uh, hit the, I'm... you have to hit the 45 once you hit pit entrance, but you have but... to commit to pit road off of coming into three. And just let them rip around the out around yeah. the apron. Yeah, they said it was sketchy the way it was. <laughs> like that's the only thing that I thought of. Yeah, given well. you you have to make sure that that I mean that portion is clean in order to do that. But like I said, maybe I'm just a creature for for calamity. And <laughs> I'm telling you what, we probably would have had somebody lose it up into the pack. Let's be honest. Yeah. I'm yeah. just gonna say we smashed up enough stuff. Now somebody <laughs> that a Kyle Larson or somebody that is vies for every inch you know the homestead mistake last year yeah um now imagine somebody trying to get everything they got tires sliding and they slide back up into traffic i mean that, oh, i mean that damn near happened to mcdowell it's just he slid into the inside wall instead of sliding outside yeah he had the whole back stretch to even think about it yeah yeah but, no it, it's it's intriguing it's interesting i don't I, know i think the argument too is that it's no different than bristol where you have yeah. two different styles of pitting depend, depending on whether you're in green or yellow. Or you got to run all the way around depending on, on where yellow. you're at, right? Yep. Both, both front and back stretch. Yep. So I guess it's no different than that too, so. Yeah. <laughs> Wild. Yeah. Um. Otherwise, again, it was, it was pretty well, pretty quiet throughout the race. You had maybe a couple of one one car incidents. Uh, there throughout the race, and then just before the end of stage two, uh, down that back stretch, Joy Logano and Busher they just lost the air, tagged the wall, and piled into each other, which yeah. that really well, screwed our my fantasy at least. Well, those single car spins, they were just so aero dependent. The guys oh, were literally just losing, they weren't even touching them. That if you got somebody just right, which that makes it even more intriguing because. When you listen to the guys, at least they were saying, like, especially Cindric, who late in that race, he just said, he goes, I can follow a lot tighter than the others, other guys are. He goes, that makes me dangerous and valuable. Yep. So when you talk about who you want to push you and, again, kind of some some plate race and tile style antics there at the end where you got guys that are, okay, you're running in that second row. Who are you going to push? Especially yeah. with. Cindric being there, and then Blaney obviously was in that finish. But and if you want a guy that's not going to spin out in front of you, trying to make your way up through the front, correct. That's a guy you want to be just suckered onto his back tail. You know, you saw it with Keselowski. I mean, that car snapped when he lost it. Yeah, it like gone. It, it, 
It like it like it hit an oil patch. It's basically what it was. Yeah. Just bam, it was gone. And then yeah, with Keselowski, I mean, you just saw you know, they saw that in car camera. He had that wheel. He just kept turning and turning and turning, and it just went nowhere. It got just so arrow tight, and it just pushed. Yeah, there's a couple of those that were just hey. Yeah. I mean, and then you throw in <clears throat> Briscoe, who was had a rocket. But when he would get in traffic, he couldn't make the bottom stick. He was so tight. But when he had a rocket, he wasn't afraid to go three wide or oh, yeah. to, to slide somebody and go up in there. Yep. Kevin Harvick literally called it on the broadcast. Like he's gonna wreck himself doing this. He's gonna wreck himself doing it, and it's only a matter of time. And you could tell like he had the runs, he had the speed, but he didn't have the handling to make it, it work in the long run. And so it was like and he got he got a little over ambitious with the four wide. Yep, and he eventually bit off more than he could chew, and it was, you know, you could just tell anybody anytime somebody got outside him, he got tight and was running him up a lane or stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I don't know, it was wild. And then I don't know if you saw qualifying on like on Saturday, but like Eric Jones' qualifying lap was like, he had his hands full. Did you see those busy? Oh, yeah. Guys? <laughs> yeah. Well, he even. He even said he goes. He was in. He was in between the point of, do I just let it spin and stay in it and keep it off the outside wall, or do I try to drive through it? Like he was just. He was at. It was decision time. Yeah. So. Uh before we get back to the qualifying deal and the shenanigans that happened during that, I want to <laughs> talk about that four wide move that Cendric pulled off to going down that front stretch. Cindric was not afraid of much. <laughs> you got it. You got it a bit. That was a hell of a move. And they did it for a whole, almost a whole lap. They ran four yeah. wide there for a little while. I mean, he, you heard it in the, if you were listening to the TV portion of it, I wish I was listening to the radio portion or pulled up the radio portion. I can't imagine what that call was like going through one and two with them four wide, but you heard it on TV, like them guys, you could tell they were out of their seats for that. Well, I'm, Denny was in the mix of that four wide too. And if you don't listen to his podcast, I'm a new listener and enjoying it. But he said, he's like, my spotter told me four wide. And he's like, I immediately got off the gas. Yeah. He's like, the racing was so tight. It did nothing for him. He was still stuck four wide. Like he was yeah. trying to get out of it, but the racing was so tight and guys are pushing and whatever. He's like, did nothing for me. Got stuck four wide. So, I mean, it was awesome to watch. But as Kept a driver, you know damn well that's. I mean, everybody was on the edge of their seats thinking, is this actually happening? And are they yeah. making this stick? But I'm going to be honest. I don't, I don't love the move. Knowing how narrow of a track that. Atlanta is. I mean, he, they pulled it off. And you did but, it from the lead, too. If you wreck out in the lead, everybody's piling in. Oh, absolutely. There wasn't any going anywhere. You looked into no. the other wrecks. You had single car spins, and guys were sailing off in there, and you had nowhere to go. Yep. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I will say one thing. Some of the guys that we, and I'm sure we'll get to this, we mentioned it briefly in our chat, but – we don't call we don't like calling for people's job, but some of the people we put on blast in the off season about <laughs> hey, you're on the hot seat and show up. They're showing up. Obviously, Suarez gets the win and Sindrick has had he's had a car to beat two weeks in two weeks in a row. Yep. Been able to run up front, do everything he's needed. Um so it definitely is interesting and I don't know. I listened to, to Denny's podcast today, and he said that the Suarez win actually makes things more muddy for oh. Mac House than anything. Absolutely. Because uh -huh. he says Justin Marks will always say, or he said last night after the win, I can't imagine Track House without Daniel Suarez. And Denny said, now, granted, he's saying all he can say, but he's not saying – 
he's going to be driving a cup car for us. Sure. And Very so he cool. said, now this one, he's like, it does well for Daniel for whatever. But he said, it's going to make the whole track house situation a lot more muddy. Cause he's like, and then Danny even said it. And now, and nowadays, if you got two drivers that are equal, it comes down to dollars and cents. Yep. And if somebody's got more money behind them. Well, and on top of that, you also have to remember they have two other guys in Van Gisbergen. He's driving for Colleg, but he's they got a little deal going on with Colleg there, but he's a he's a track house driver. And um, Zane Smith is tapped to run a cup car for track house next yep. year. Correct. So you've got those two, and now it's like you're looking at it going. It makes the decision easier if Daniel Hem or not Daniel Hemmer, Daniel Suarez has a tough go of it. Maybe maybe just squeaks into the playoffs or doesn't get a win but points his way in or whatever he does. Like it, that decision becomes a little bit more clear, I guess, in yeah. in that sense. But they've got those two guys waiting in the wings. Is that the right terminology for that? I guess. Yeah, I would agree. Yep that that makes that a whole lot tougher because. Let's be honest. We kind of said it before the season started, and we called it out that he was somebody that was potentially on the hot seat. Yep. What's your – and since we're kind of on that topic, we'll we'll cover it a little bit here. What's your thought? Because we've seen it now in the past two years with a couple drivers. Cole Custer goes back down to Xfinity, goes on, has a pretty good year. We now see A.J. Allmendinger back down in Xfinity Series, obviously do be ter- to be determined what kind of year he has. Who's to say that Suarez goes down with a new track house car? in Xfinity series and it's kind of the the flagship driver for that while and you introduce say Zane Smith moves up and now Suarez has a teammate in SVG in the Xfinity series as well or a satellite series with with uh, Colic. So going back to last week, you know, we, I asked about that car he was driving. That was part of an alliance. It Colic didn't own the car but that was part of an alliance that they had with Colic. So it was I Think it it's might kind of been, one of those colleagues building the car, but Trackhouse is paying for it. That, or it might have been SS Greenlight or one of those other teams that they kind of had an alliance with. I can't remember who it was. It wasn't Trackhouse. I heard it was Colleg and SS Greenlight. So, yeah, they had Colleg was basically building the car, and SS Greenlight was footing the bill for some yeah. of it, but it was their car and Colleg was building them. And, but Again, and who's to say that they don't do something like that? Yeah, well, that's line. an interesting deal to to start with. That I, whole situation, I know that, and again, it adds another layer to the job portion where it seems that Trackhouse and Colleg have a little driver partnership. Do you want to call it? But I think it could be also too. Do you now have too many drivers in your stable that? Your hand is your hand is being forced on who you need to go with. Correct. For on both I, parties. Correct. Absolutely. I don't know. It's a lot of moving pieces there. And, and obviously call it now they're back down to that three car deal, but yep. Who's to say that Suarez doesn't do that again somewhere where a track where he's confident or comfortable or colleague says, Yep, this is this is a week that we need you. If Suarez wins again, is his seat solidified? Yep. For sure. And I, I can't think, I can't disagree with it. I, I mean if if you're replacing that in today's day and age, if you're replacing somebody who just got you two wins, you gotta have a damn good reason for you it. You gotta have a good reason to it to do it. Yep. And what it comes down to is you gotta have a reason that can do that and some more. Yep. Yeah. Now Let's be honest. There's a lot of season left. We're we're looking at two data oh. points here. For you. <laughs> oh. Yep. That takes to a lot me, of pressure already off of Suarez for the year. And to me, that was an interesting one because he hasn't always been a restrictor play guy. Correct. It's well, not track house as a team has been a restrictor plate team. True, but they're kind that, of like RFK, where them two—it's either they're both up in the front or they're both in the back. They just kind of work together. True. 
Well, if you guys did your research uh, for fantasy, I believe Suarez was in the top 10 in the last four day, uh, last four Atlanta races prior to this one. So basically all four races of this style Atlanta. Correct. He's been in the top 10. So um, I don't know what it is. I don't that he I don't. just likes it. Yeah, because yeah, Suarez was, was looking at last year's. He was second in the fall race. And he was not in the top 10 on the spring race. I'm trying to find him, though. Interesting. Maybe it's top 10 for the last five. I don't know. It was something that he, he's had a good yeah, It had been, yeah. But I don't know. It's, it would it was an interesting race across the board. Um, let's before I we sh- go go ahead. I was gonna say before we touch on the finish, let's get to the qualifying shenanigans that I think we kind of want to talk about. <laughs> Mr. Joey Legato's my... webbed gloves. All right, Mister, I'm gonna take my window net down at Daytona before they even see it. All of a sudden, I'm driving all my gloves off. I. So it's like yeah. we were we were talking amongst each other, like, did he have this at Daytona? And then I sent you guys that video that I saw tonight and looked like he had that glove for Daytona. So Yeah, I in we were talking about before the Denny's actions detrimental. I mean Yes, there's the SFI, there's the safety, there's all of that that goes with it. But again, it's no different than confiscating uh Stuart Haas's oh the yep fins, the, the fins, fins on the side of the car yep. where they confiscated the ten and the forty one. It's kind of the same deal. I mean, We're I have would two expect, big penalties coming down this week. I'm going to expect that they're going to the twenty two team is going to take a hit here for this. This isn't just a hey, don't do that type of situation. Yeah. I. Yeah. It's not going to be a, hey, we're checking everybody's gloves now situation. This is a, we're going to make an example out of you. Correct. Yeah, this is a, we, you fooled us once, shame on us. Fool us twice, shame on you. Yeah. We got you this time. (laughs) (laughs) I want to know how they found out about it. Currently 33rd in the points, Joey Logano is. Uh, How many points does he have? How many points? Um... (laughs) Oh God! Points stage eighteen. Does that sound 18 right? Eighteen points. That's probably about right. Zero stage point. Eighteen points. There's no way. I thought he had more than that. Because I read the statistic. Um, him and Todd Gillen have led the most laps this year, and they are currently 32nd and 33rd in points. Yep. So, yes, he does have 18 points. So, penalties like this typically hit that 25, 30, 50 point range. <laughs> he's, he's <got laughs> we, may be, we may be talking about negative points here when, when this is said and done. He's got himself in must win to get in territory already. <laughs> Week number three. <laughs> Given we got to wait for the penalty to come out, but yeah. in there's some, recent history, there's something coming. This this isn't yeah. just going to be a hey, take your gloves off type of situation. Yeah. Fun fact: Kyle Busch is in the lead, points given two data points. But um, I have always been a fan of innovation, especially on the cheating side of things. So I think it was a fantastic move. I know others think otherwise. But I think it was fantastic up until you get caught. Well, I would, I guess you always talk about, you know, guys always have their hand in that window yep. slot. I guess I never thought about it as spreading your fingers, you know, this way. Yeah. And you can flat hand it where other guys have had to go on back of the hand. Yep. You know, you're going, you're looking at it here where he could go hand up always where I could feel like it'd be more comfortable. You could be a little bit stronger with that hand yeah. away. But. <laughs> I mean, there's the old saying in racing, if you ain't cheating, you're trying. I mean, we see it all the time. Joe Shear and Majeski last year with the valve stems and stuff like that. I mean, these guys are always trying to do get oh, yeah. an extra tenth on a qualifying lap, whatever. But when stuff like this comes out, it 
to be frank, it just pisses me off because it's, <laughs> I mean, he's cheating. And then it's like, not only that, it's like, so it's one thing if like, you know, they confiscate whatever they confiscate. The fins off of. Yeah. And it's like, okay, if these aren't to spec, you know, whatever, figure out why they are, but that whatever that is, but it's like, I don't know. I'm guessing the team or whoever the whole 22 team, maybe outside of the pit crew, knows he's getting in the car with a webbed glove. And it's like, all right, you're going to get it. Everybody knows, like, yeah. Just kind of like, uh, whatever. It's uh, it's a moral and respect thing. You're going to do it until you're going to get caught, which is whatever, but it's like, Come on, dude. You're knowingly and willing to yeah. get in the car cheating and you're okay with it. Like, get out of here. So, like, my other thing, too, is like, because I mean, that web went all the way up his thumb, basically. Like, it was full on. Pretty close. Yeah. So, he was not, so he was not wrapping his finger around either. Correct. There's no he way he'd be able to wrap it around his wheel. Unless there was enough play. Unless there was enough up. web in there. Yeah. He, we we'll have to do a little more investigation on that whole situation. Yeah. <laughs> Still, I give him credit for, for the innovation of whoever came up with that. Well, I'm going to tell you what I thought of this right away. The next thing that's coming, there's going to be an F, uh, SFI rated glove with webbing. Somebody's going to, there's a, there's a money market for that. Somebody's too. going to petition for it. They'll petition for it and they can say, all right, super or plate races or super speedway races. Sure. You can wear that glove. It's SFI rated. You get your hands caught in the wheel. It's on you. Sure. Well, but eh. I think that's where you get the 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 kicker, though. Give it. It's no different than not letting go of the wheel. Right. Sign so, your name on the sign your name on the dotted line if you're willing to take that risk. I suppose. It's up to you. I don't know. Funny, but not for me at the same time. Sure. Uh Let's talk about the finish real quick, and then we'll move on from there. I know we talked about it, how that was a hell of a finish. I can't believe that they stayed three wide, honestly. I thought Bush was going to end up falling back, and it was going to be a two-horse race. But they he made it all the way through that turn three and up into the start-finish line. I was surprised. But, I mean, you want to talk about a scene straight out of the Cars movie. You, you can't know, get much better than that. I mean, for us, this is probably in, – in... I kind of thought about it because, you know, every time, I don't want to say every time, 99% of the time you walk into Atlanta, what does everyone go back to? The Kevin Harvick, Jeff Gordon finish. It was that type of finish without yep. the emotion in it. Yep. Especially being the, the RCR deal with Earnhardt Sr. and what went on and how he ended up in that car. But yep. when well, you talk about finishes, that – that. Uh, were yet to be proven wrong, but last year you had the Blaney finish with Talladega, and now yep. we've got this twice now in a short span here. And NASCAR wanted to make these cars equal. You got what you wanted. Yep. Can't blame yeah. them. Yeah. I, Go ahead. I was gonna say, like, I thought about Atlanta. Like, Atlanta has always produced good finishes. You talked about like er, like Earnhardt and Bobby Labonte back in the day. They had a uh, side by side finish. You talked about the Harvick one, uh, Edwards, where he got his first win. He beat Johnson, coming to the line. At Atlanta has had a history of just great finishes, and it just added another one to its to its collection. Yeah, yeah, and I think not only that, but one the finish that I mean you could almost argue was that the best super speedway finish we've seen in the next gen car. In the next gen car, absolutely. Yeah, I saw they were kind of debating that on door bumper clear. Some of the teasers they've been releasing, um, but not only that, kudos to those guys for keeping it clean. Yes. Yeah, we didn't. Bush could have no ran. Yellow. Bush could have ran Suarez up in the wall. Blaney could have ran Bush up a lane higher, and then Bush is running. No. Kudos to those three for keeping Put it through the wide. Not put, lifting, keep it clean, and let's put just the little, foot in the pedal and just hang on. Good old fashioned, race it out. Yep. Everybody kept it clean because that's almost 
coming out of four there, that was a Daytona like could have had the big one again. Yep. Three wide, but no, I mean that finish was. And you, I don't think you heard any disappointment out of Blaney or Bush about it. No. Well, when you watched Blaney, when they were interviewing him, they had the screen on the side, and you saw his reaction to seeing the finish live, yeah. and he was like, "Holy hell!" Yeah. Um, but I mean, so you, you talk about these finishes with these plates. Yeah, we had we had Blaney at Talladega. That was close, but that was a two car race. Yeah. Now you you added another car to that. They all got to the finish. All and you had three cars within seven thousandths of a second of each other. The winner to second was three thousandths of a second. Like, yep. You can't. We're literally, we're literally talking this to this for those yeah. first three cars. Yep. So just insane. And but I, you just you sat there and they're like, it's too close to call. Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> they had to go back to video on the scoring. Mode. Yeah. And I want to just, in general, shout out Atlanta for the racing it put on yesterday. I mean, because that was absolutely phenomenal across the board, the whole race. And one of the tweets I saw, um, Van Grohl, you, you're this is right up your alley. That F1 stuff. Drive to survive, yeah. Well, n- not that, but like, oh, F- the, yep, yep, yep. What do you do when you get a run on somebody and you, you zoom right around them? Uh, oh, DRS. Whatever it is, um, it was almost like that in a cup car. Yes. The drafting was so phenomenal yep. that it was not only that, but like the Cindric four wide. You got could a, just see it, him. Got a slipstream. Y- yep. Slip Driving stream. right up to him, pull out. And then in the corners, those guys would almost a dirt slide job. Yep. Clear him on the bottom side, slide up right in front of him. I mean, the racing was phenomenal. So that kind of brings me to the point, uh, which was the kind of the main bullet point I wanted to hit with Atlanta. And I posed the question in here, did making Atlanta or is this style of racing at Atlanta okay now? Because obviously it had a lot of backlash when it first came out a couple of years ago. And I think everybody knew it was going to be an adaption process. Are we to that point now We were that we are okay with this style of racing at Atlanta? Well... So I'm going to say yes on the stipulation of I think we're finally starting to see that surface take a little wear. Guys are starting to talk about walking the track, and they're looking at the the bumps in three and four yep. that kind of starting to come back. And um, it's starting to wear a little bit, that surface. And you can see they had a few patches in there in a few places that they're yep. starting to bring – it's starting to get a little bit more character to it that it's not just brand new asphalt that you can just hammer down, run wide open, and you know it's going to stick. Sure. So I think, yeah, I think it is. And it's just taken a little bit for that surface to get a little character. And they had talked about that, and guys literally were flying over the racetrack taking pictures of it to see the wear, and they had engineers looking at the wear of the racetrack. So I yeah. think that's where we're starting to get a little bit more of that Atlanta character back in that surface. I, so I am also okay with this type of racing, but I don't want it to leave Atlanta. Like I know Texas is kind of on that next conversation of a track that might need a repave type of thing or needs to do something with its racing. I don't, yeah. Texas needs to come up State with something. Texas. State, yes. Texas. Yep. State Texas. Atlanta stays Atlanta. You keep it there. Because I, I just don't want the mile and a half to all turn into this because then we're just plate racing all year. Correct. Then then let's just be NASCAR restrictor. And we know and, and it, we know it works because of the Coke 600 at Charlotte. Mile and a half works there. Correct. Yeah, I'm I'd say I'm I'm okay with the with the type of racing. The only thing is that Denny had kind of alluded to it. it is it just you just it the race results aren't always going to show what the race was, what the race was. And the best car is not always going to win because this type of race, and we all know it takes one mistake and you've got 16 cars with damage that are sure. You no longer a factor at winning. So. And I yeah, could argue I that. Don't, 
Yeah, I just don't I want to do that anyway. Guys, I'm not going to repeat it, but I, yeah, like you said, I just don't want it to bleed over into other mile and a half tracks. Um, yeah. Yeah. Keep it Atlanta. Um, Keep the racing what it is now everywhere else. Yeah. Also wanted to shout out Danny and Chase Elliott. Those guys. <laughs> Talk about two guys that I swear every time there was a caution, they were they were involved. Oh man! And not only that, but the next gen car is nothing. They could patch it well enough that they could drive it to the front again and find themselves in the next caution. Oh. It was Chase Elliott every time, which that was my race winning pick from last uh, last week's episode. Every time I'm like, dude, finally, we're cracking the top 10 as he's got damage on his nose from literally lap two. And then he's spinning on the infield. Then he's spinning on the backstretch. It's like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Also, thank you, Austin Dillon, for your service. You saw my fantasy lineup for two weeks, and you I don't think you'll see it the rest of the year. <laughs> you made it about a combined four laps in two races before you're in the garage. Yeah. Anyways. So, any other thoughts with uh, Atlanta before we move on here? No. Uh, the, think... finish, the finish is everything. Yeah. It says it all. No, I thought it was, again, phenomenal racing. That f- finish was, I mean, great for the sport, too. We talk about, um, which if you stay tuned, we're going to be dropping a bonus episode on the NASCAR Full, full Speed ep- uh, Netflix series. For any new fans that that has brought on, I mean, what a start for those new fans to see a race like that. Um, yeah. Phenomenal for the sport and NASCAR and everything. And I just saw a tweet before we hop, before we move on, that somebody said, man, I was sleeping on y'all this NASCAR shit. This is better than playoff basketball. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> that was yeah. like, Honestly, I'm like, yeah, I'm like, for real. Um, not that we're going to say we're better than any sport, but if as long as we can keep growing the sport and people getting exposed to it and enjoying it, um, it's all the better for the sport. So, no, it was a fantastic race. Really enjoyed it. But looking forward to settling down a little bit. Let's get into some mile and a half racing and settle down a little bit. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about some uh, racing at Golden Isles. And I guess we'll just start with uh, High Limit, since they got both of their nights in the uh, in over the weekend. So uh, I would say so far there isn't really a bad race to talk about when it comes to High Limit. And I think we've got you know we had two back to back, well not back to back, but two races out of out of there that showed up pretty good. And I think night two definitely stole the show with three guys under a blanket fighting for the win. Right. Hey. We, we kind of talk about Atlanta being a unique style in, in that, but I also think Golden Isles is just one of those tracks that just produces on the dirt side. You And the late models, again, same thing. They just – they produced there for that whole Deuces Wild deal there. Yep. Um, but, they, again, the sprint cars, they were able to move around um, and find different grooves that they could find speed in that track that – it's just it's open enough that you can run the top. You can you can wrap the bottom. Yep. Uh, it just Golden Isles just produces in itself. So, um, even with that rain out, they were able to get that thing prepped and ready to rip. Yeah, and I think I I'm not gonna I'll beat the same drum. Um, two fantastic nights of racing for the for that series. Um, in somebody who is making a good case for himself, um, an early contender who I don't want to say I wasn't expecting, but I guess maybe I was sleeping on him a little bit. But Tyler Courtney, um, yep, he's quickly making a name for him. No, well, not making a name for himself, but he's quickly making a few statements that says, Hey, I'm going to have something to say about who's going to win this championship. Um, and I'm going to keep my name in the mix. So, um, he's been after he got the win, uh, at East Bay. Yeah. Um, 
followed up and went back to back. Yeah, he is looking strong. Um, but yeah, that Saturday night, he was out of the picture, and then all of a sudden you look back and there he is just ripping the very bottom, and you got three yep. guys under a blanket in lap traffic duking it out. Um was fantastic. So I I was flipping through because I know I flip back to our hot takes for 2024. And pretty much all of us said that the high limit was going to come down to Brad Seat, Brad Sweet, and Rico Abreu. I boy, do we look like idiots right now? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, even our hot takes. Yeah, but Sweet is second, it. but we didn't even. We were. I mean, Christ, we were debating who was going to win more money or who was going to win more features between yeah. Sweet and Abreu, and here we are going. Tyler Courtney, welcome to the party. Spencer Baston. Yeah, Brett Marks. The start of the year. Yeah, yep. Brett Marks is another one. Like, we were, you know, we talk about guys listening to our podcast and turning their years around. You're like, you know, them guys are like, shit, they're not even talking about us. Let's go prove them wrong. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, that that 7BC program has got it, got it whipped up right now. That they do. Points leader. Yeah. Um, and now I'm not going to say Brad Sweet. I mean, yeah, find he, it. Hasn't, he hasn't had the the run the up front, but I'm just going to tell you guys, he's quietly just chipping away. They always, you know, the old NASCAR adage, you know, whatever car you have, if you got a seventh place car, finish seventh. Yep. If you got a third place car, finish third. He's doing exactly that quietly, finishing all the races, consistent. Um, he's just not having the he's not in the mix right now which is kind of interesting you know not seeing him up there sliding for win or in the top three and under that blanket it's it's other guys but I think he's going to figure it out and he will be that guy but yeah um, and I hope for the sake of our credibility um, <laughs> that he does but yeah, Tyler Cartney is he's on a tear. Jacob yeah. Allen, Brent Marks. I mean, every, I mean, I'll be the first to, I'll be the first in line to say I did not expect or anticipate or see this coming. Nope. Not at all. That and, and you even you even look down the list and you got um Courtney Sweet, Marks, based and Corey Day is another one. You got the law firm, Parker Price Miller. Um, the sweet is in the mix and he's been chipping away, but this again, it goes back to points racing. He's, he's not winning features, but I'll tell you what, he's putting together the finishes he needs to be there in the long haul. And we're talking about a five time world of outlaws series champion. Correct. He knows how to race throughout the year. Yep. <laughs> he, he, correct. So, so I, he definitely can't be out of the conversation. No, never. And, and the, I think that it'll be the same for Rico. And I think Rico will, he'll settle down. Sure. He'll settle down. He'll settle in. He's proven that he can find speed. He, he'll do it. He'll be able to figure out a way to make speed somewhere. It's just going to be, might need to find his footing here a little bit and get comfortable and get going. And make it sure you're finishing the races. Correct. Yeah, you can't, you can't finish parked upside on junk like you did at East Bay. Yep. Uh, I want to kind of transition, and I'm going to use this as kind of a transition point. You mentioned that they kind of teamed up with Lucas Oil to do the double down or deuces down uh, deal with High Limit and Lucas Oil. Yep. Do we think it's a good combo, having them two series kind of pull a double header with each other? I liked the format that they split the nights. Each each show got their own night, and then they ran together. Given so Lucas I Oil think got when rained you look out at the way they did, night. yeah, Lucas Oil got rained out on Friday night. But I liked the way that it was set up that each show or each series got their own night, um, on their own to just yep run their stuff, do their thing. It's they were the main event, and it's a sprint car show tonight. And then tonight, stack them together. Hell yeah, yep. I, I I enjoy it. And I will say we got cut short. Um, on the Friday night show. But one thing to that point that I really did enjoy was flip flopping 
drivers in the booth and oh. Devin yeah. Moran being on uh on <laughs> the, the infield interview. doing the interviews. Obviously, different cars, different driving styles, and different setups and all that, but still dirt guys on dirt and no have a ton of knowledge. I thought that was a fantastic move. We had Tim McCready and who was the other one in the booth on Thursday night? Overton, Brandon Overton. Brandon Overton. And then you had Devin Moran who was doing um the he was in the infield, he was doing the inter or the victory interviews. Um yeah. that I thought was really awesome. And then they were gonna swap it on Friday night, and the sprint car guys were gonna do the play, some of the play by play, and they were gonna put a sprint car guy yeah. in the infield. I thought that was a really cool experience, really cool for a viewer, provide just a again a unique experience insight all that so i thought that was one of the 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 sleeper good moves that they had well see if they could pull that again type of thing here's another angle to that devin moran's down in the infield right on the track watching the way the track transitions not that other guys are, aren't watching the feature but he's he's down in there now track can obviously change from night to night but uh but he picked up honestly he picked up that microphone in the infield it's like he had done it all season Hey, Devin, we got a question. I always love to go, yeah, what's up? <laughs> we got a question. Yeah, what's up? <laughs> oh. So I'm trying, to, I'm trying to page through the schedule here, and I'll let you guys kind of piggyback off of that and talk about uh, World or sorry, not World of Outlaws, uh, Lucas Oil and the night that they had um, race, being able to race on just Saturday night and Mike Marler, again, I think, you know, we talked about it before with him kind of switching over at the end of last year, coming out strong at the beginning of the year, keep showing that he's, uh, he's making a name for himself and is going to be in the hunt this year for a title. Yeah. Not that I want to toot my own horn, but if anybody had a chance to listen to my race preview, um, last weekend or last week in that little five minute preview, I dropped, I literally said, Mike Marler. If he can get a good start, if he can execute a full night, a good qualifying run, win a heat, and he can start up front, watch out. And for once in his life, he said, I'm not going to go for the hard charger award today. I'm going to try to win this whole show. <laughs> and started so, in front and went nuclear on the field. So I'm just looking at the points. Marler's sitting eighth in the points with two guys ahead of him that are not going to run. The full schedule. The full schedule, Lucas Oil, one being Brandon Shepard and the other being Jimmy Owens. So it, that doesn't change the points gap from Ricky to him. But again, Ricky had a tough night. He absolutely killed that thing in the heat race, went to a backup and just, I don't even, did he not, he didn't finish the feature, I don't think, did he? He pulled no, he off. Pulled yeah. Yeah. So he, I mean, somebody tugged on Superman's cape a little bit, and as they would say, the conqueror reached out and grabbed him in that heat race. Um, but I mean, he's Marler's 185 points back, but he, I mean, the dude's proven that this new Skyland Motorsports thing is there's speed in those race cars, so. I I I'm gonna go on a limb here, and I'm gonna say he might be a guy that finds himself in the final four. Yeah, because that's the other thing too. You just got to keep yourself in that final four. He could be a guy that he. I mean, you start talking about going to Eldora. The dude's pretty good at Eldora. So if he can just keep himself there, I'm gonna say he could be a guy that. He, he honestly, he could do the Devin Moran of, of last year. He could be a guy that gets in the final four and all of a sudden he's there. Yep. He could, he could shake this thing up in a hurry. And obviously we know that JD is absolutely lights out at Eldora as well. And Hudson O'Neill and Ricky have proved that they can win there as well, but hey, welcome to the party, Mike Marler. Yeah. It, if he can, he's shown flashes Yep. But we're, we're riding a roller coaster right now. Mm -hmm. And if we can not ride so much of the roller coaster, if we can just flatten this out just a little bit, 
he's going to be there mixing it up every week. Yep. If he's not in the top four, he's going to be in five and six, and he's going to be a win away from getting himself in. And again, that Cam, that kind of goes back to the point you made earlier about just knowing your car and what you got. He's a savvy vet in the sense of when he knows what he's got, 99% of the time he'll bring it home where it belongs to be just because he'll take care of his equipment. Well, and it's like you were you were saying earlier too, Cam, or you know, whoever it was, I was looking at something up something. Um uh, hey, I'm not going for a hard charger today. I'm going for that top spot. And again, it's one of those he knew he had that car and went for it. Yeah. He he strung together a full night. Yep. I was looking through the schedule. I looked at both the High Limit and Lucas Oil series, their schedules. That was the only weekend that they line up with each other. Given I, they might be geographically close and I'm geographically challenged when it comes to where tracks are located. <laughs> so they could be close, but as far as at the same track, they don't have any more head to heads with each other. Or double yeah, headers, be, I should say. Yeah, that's probably a little experiment on their part to see logistically how it goes. Did the drivers like it? Did they not? what they thought about it because they each i mean honestly they each got a, they got a practice night yep and then everybody had their own night to race and then watch how it went so i'd be i'd be genuinely curious to know what the drivers thought of that format because yeah. at the end of the day they're the ones that are going to voice their opinions on how they felt that that whole logistically to all that stuff i that to me i'd be curious to know what the feedback is on that i think from a fan perspective too i mean christ you got damn near every driver that you could ever want to watch at one place. Yeah. Between it's like, us, yeah. you know, us and Cedar Lake, you got all the late model guys that you could ever want, want racing. They're all there. Yep. But now you got both of the best of both worlds, literally. Absolutely. I was going to say overall thoughts from a dirt fan perspective, if I live down there in Georgia, I, that is like, oh, clear yeah. your calendar there. Clear your calendar that Saturday night. You are there. The opportunity that those two series are going to be at the same track, you obviously just mentioned. I mean, that's the best of the best on a dirt track, and you're going to get them in one night. I mean. The only other spot you might get that is the Dirt World Championships in Charlotte. Yep. Yep, absolutely. And that, I mean, even watching it, I was, it's like, no offense to support divisions, but. Everybody's there it, for the, the big show. It takes a little wind out of the sails when, when you're watching Lucas O and they're like, all right, we're going to pull out some modifieds. And then it's just like, all right. Great time to go make some popcorn. Uh, <laughs> but that, I mean, that was like, I mean, well, best it, it, it was just like, there was no drop off in racing. You roll one badass race right into the next, right into the next, the whole night. I mean, it was just, I thought it was fantastic. Well, even to your point, Cam, you know, you talk about the support divisions, like, we're just so in tune with the big dogs and the high horsepower and the high speeds. But at the end of the day, for those support divisions, that as well is a great opportunity for those guys to get the race in front of a packed racetrack. True. It's for them. It's maybe, maybe the money isn't the biggest money race of the year, but when you roll out and you can potentially hear the crowd over the car, that's for them on that aspect as well. That's a pretty cool deal. So um, I think it, that comes from a point of we're just so ready to rip on on the four tens and and the super late models that that's the when you hear a super late model wind up, unfortunately, the crate six oh fours just quite aren't the same, you know. <laughs> no. I'm just uh, me as a biased dirt late super late model guy. That's how I feel, but yeah, so. I but no, that. I mean, overall, I thought it was 
it sucked. I really wish we could have got the the Friday night portion of Lucas Oil and then being able to have the sprint car guys in the booth and doing that that interview because I really did like that on Thursday night. But overall, um, yeah, that was awesome event across the board. Yeah, for sure. I was actually looking ahead. I was thinking about the world uh, world finals at Charlotte and. I was an idiot when entering the schedule and I did not put the right dates for the world outlaw late model. So I'm updating that as we speak. I'm just telling you guys like in the next like year or two, like probably not this year for me, but I'm telling you guys like that has got to be a bucket list for us. Well, so you (laughs) say that I'm actually thinking about maybe crossing that one off my list this year. Because I've got some vacation days to burn. The Dirt Track World Championships? Yeah. It's not quite a big vacation hour issue for me. It's more so a financial backing issue for me. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose. I spend my money a little foolishly with that. So yeah, we gotta get somebody to as they would say, we gotta have somebody riding along with us for that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you that or snowball, but anyways, <laughs> yep. Um, no, any uh, any final thoughts as we kind of wrap up uh, Gold Niles and the racing with High Limit and Luke Soil? I've grown to love Gold Niles, I'll tell you that right now. After watching Speed Weeks here and them racing down there more consistently, Gold Niles just produces, yeah, fantastic, fantastic night across board. Fun fact, I didn't realize Kyle Bronson went in and bought Gold Niles a few years ago. So Kyle Bronson owns that place uh, or is a part owner. Um, but no, that was – anytime you got somebody like that who's a part track owner, you know it's going to be done right and the track's going to be well-prepped and – Tip-top. Tip-top across the board. Um, racing, show – flow of events, everything from Thursday to Saturday night. Well done. So I'm going to throw an oddball question here before we kind of dive into some quick race previews, kind of an, again, oddball question. This is about other than some regional stuff that's going on. We're two months into the racing season, into the calendar year. What do we think of the racing so far this year? Just on an overall basis between short track, NASCAR, late models, sprint cars, just overall. What do we think of the racing season so far? I'm going to say it's... Scale of 10. Scale of 10. Right now, I'm going to... And this is me because I'm I'm more in tune with it now. And I'm, I've got the more competitive side and understanding strategies and tires and slick and cushion and all this other stuff that we talk about from a pure race strategy i'm like an 8.7 right now a couple nights tracks rubber up you get one lane but i feel like across the board the racing is more competitive than it's been i feel the racing's a little a lot tighter um and maybe that's just me watching more of it all the time but i'm like i'm like an 8.7 right now um uh, yeah, I'm more than happy yeah. with it. So first, the number that came to my mind was eight. Okay. So I'll I'll say about I'll go eight point one. Um, I would just say from all aspects of racing, all disciplines, and I'll again stand be the first to stand in line. We're seeing guys win races that I would have never picked. Mm-hmm. And guys being able to have cars to run up front and to be able to do that and watch that is awesome. I mean, to be able to watch Dalton Wilson get his win, Garrett Alberson running up front. I mean, Brent Marks. I mean, all these guys that it's like, yeah, we've known they're in the series and they run well, but you don't always pick them for race wins to see these guys running up front and competing for wins. And then you go to the truck series and Xfinity and NASCAR, I think across the board, um, 
really against across any discipline is I think it's in a phenomenal spot. So um, to go to your point, I think yeah. we gotta I do think we gotta let's some of these dirt tracks, hey, let's try to let's get a little bit better. We could group them up a little bit more. We cannot have a you know a three second winner. But I think it's saying there is room that I think we can help. We can improve and we will. I'm going to say two things are going to get me to the end of the nine range here. One, when NASCAR gets off the super speedways, we start going to Phoenix. We start going to Vegas. We start going to Charlotte. Get the heart of the schedule. We get into the heart of the schedule. We start running some short tracks. We go to Martinsville or we go to some of these other um, more racy type tracks where super speedways can be more luck. That's going to get me in the nine. Um, but I'm going to say once we get into the heart of the schedule for especially Lucas Oil High Limit, once we hit the ground running and they're on all the time, that's where I'm in my nine range. Sure. So for me, it a little bit with the super speedways just because they are in some instances more so luck of just not being in someone else's crap um, where – you can get a, you can shake up yeah. the winners and it can be more race speed and what you're doing with your car than just getting out of the way. Fair enough. I would definitely I mean, say an eight as well. Um, Again, I think it's kind of, you're waiting for that heart of the schedule to, to get going and you're waiting for more races to cut racing series to start up. Yep. Yeah. Like you still, I like you still got the racing all up here in the Midwest and late. I was going to say we, we're going to start to get into that 9.8 when it gets to be April 13th. <laughs> we go to the Dells for the first time and ASA stars national tour comes up here. Midwest tours in full swing. You got the truck series running when we're going to be talking 10, when we're sitting at the racetrack. Yeah. USAC is another one. All, all their divisions of USAC going and extreme outlaw midgets and, and them too. So you got a couple series that got to get going yet. Yeah. With the hand we're being dealt. Pretty damn good. Pretty damn good. Yeah, for um, sure. And I think, Fair yeah, enough. I think we're definitely going to get, not only from a racing perspective, on track, it's going to continue to get better as all these series get into the groove of things. We're still early for any discipline right now. And as they start settling in and getting into guys are getting more comfortable across the board, the racing is going to get better. Some yep. of these series going to track a second time. Hey, now we know what we're doing, what we want it's going to get better. And then like you yeah. guys, once we're at the track, I think you can bump it yep. up just for being at the track. So and you can, once you smell it and you hear it, you, yeah, we're good. We're in the green. <laughs> yeah. Yep. We made it. <laughs> yeah. No, I had to throw that out there. I just, it was a thought that kind of came to mind. So um, let's hop into some race previews here real quick. Um, and as we've been doing here recently, we'll get a little more in depth with these, uh, with our race preview videos that we'll pump out during the later part of the week. Uh, but we just want to kind of touch on a few of them here, uh, coming up and we'll kind of start with the world outlaw sprint cars as they get back into action here at, uh, Volusia Speedway, uh, coming up this weekend. And I believe Cam, you've got, you want to maybe touch on that for a hot minute. I am going to, so yeah, <laughs> um, no. Sprint cars have been down um, in that southeast corner to start the year. Um, World Outlaws is going to Volusia, I believe, for a second time this year. Um, and we are going there for the World Outlaws Bike Week Jamboree for um, a two-night show on Friday and Saturday or Sunday and Monday. Um, you just see 12,000 to win. Um, and then I was just going to pull up quick. Uh, David Gravel, Selzy, and Shots are your uh, top three World Outlaws in the points right now. And then um, I'm not going to go much further into detail because then you guys don't have to tune into my race preview. And I want to get the most views on race preview. So um, <clears throat> as always, um, tune into my race preview this week. We're going to touch on uh, the World Outlaw Sprint Cars. And um, yeah, like my video and not the other pit crew uh race previews <laughs> <laughs> uh cars tour the pro light models are going to get started here at Souther national owner sports park they're going to get their season started uh on the second on saturday 
Uh, and then the late model stocks are going to get started the weekend after. So again, I'll pump out a race preview on that as well. Kind of covered both of those first, first two races for the cars, late model tour. Um, you know, again, it's a lot of stout drivers in that field. It's going to be some great racing over there as well. And especially with it being kind of the second year with all the NASCAR guys at the helm, going to be a great year. So keep an eye out for a, a preview on that here coming up. Um, looking forward to another great cars tour season coming up. I know, Callan, I believe you got a late model race you want to kind of hit on here. Too. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll kind of stay on the late model scene here. So you got the Alabama 200 at Montgomery Motor Speedway. Um, just a little tease to that. They've got so far, I believe they got 27 cars on the entry list running for 10 grand to win. So um, very Good healthy change. payday with uh, some pretty impressive names. It's, 27 cars is a healthy field, but they've got some impressive hammers that are going to be in that. So um, stay tuned for that race preview as well. And then we'll go ahead and jump over to the NASCAR side. So um, you got all the series over there at Vegas. So they're going to all go around Vegas this weekend. Um, you got the three, the three NASCAR touring series there as well. And then welcome to the big show, Derek Kraus. So uh, <laughs> breaking news out of the, the racing world. We've kind of been waiting. We've been kind of speculating and thinking and seeing what's going on. But uh, the nine is going uh, cup racing in the 16 for college racing. He announced that he's got a six race slate with them. So um, pretty badass deal for that to see him uh, make that next jump. But um, stay tuned for those two. We'll drop those two. Um, do a little bonus one with that, especially the Montgomery Motor Speedway being 10 grand to win for the Show Me the Money series. So pretty cool it'll do there as well. Before we get into race picks here for Vegas, I want to touch on fantasy as we're on as we finished up week two on fantasy. We got a few new members to the crowd. So welcome to all those that ended up joining with us. Uh, if you're still wanting to join with us, you have a halfway decent chance. Uh, you may be behind the, behind the ball a little bit, but, uh, nonetheless, we do have a pretty good battle here kind of starting it out. I am your point leader so far after two races at 296 points. Dietzel is at 290, six points behind. Jackman, you are at 279. Uh, Gasman, you're at 266. Kurt Bush stand 234. Gas Man's Girls 219. And Sophie's, I want to make sure I got that name right. Sophie's Pit Pit. What was it again? Sophie's Pit Picks. Pit Picks. There it yep. is. Uh, is sitting at 145. So a little bit tight, tight battle coming into the third week. But again, we're getting that hard to schedule. This is where the picks really come into play. So with that in mind, let's do some race picks. Um, Two of us did not fare out very well with myself picking Joey Logano and Cam picking Chase Elliott. And yeah, Kellen had it was bad fast. He just couldn't keep it straight. Yeah. And then Kellen coming on top with KB coming in in third place, point seven thousandths of a second behind first. So yeah. close, but no cigar, my guy. So <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's all for three on that deal. Uh so with that. Uh, I get to pick first this week. So again, this is kind of whoa. that first race. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I finished, but I finished lower. In fantasy? No. Race picks. Race picks. Race picks. Here, guy. I thought we yeah. were going by fantasy points. No, we're doing race picks. Walmart race picks. Yeah, so you gotta you gotta dial us up here. I get I'm last, so you're second. Yeah. Well, I got my two race picks in mind already, so I if, if so it's just a matter one, if I take one of them. Yeah, I gotta if it if, if if I'm going A or B. Well, I got a feeling I'm gonna take A off your table. I gotta go with a guy that finished second and first in the two races there last year. I'm going with Kyle Larson. And then I'm going with the guy that finished fifth and second. I'm going Christopher Bell. Oh boy. You guys have kind of left me uh um I you I guess you took Larson in the Hendrick camp. I think I got to stay in the Hendrick camp. I'm going to go on a limb here. You know who's going to show up? I'm going to take Alex Bowman. He finished third in the spring last year there. Yep. I'm going to take Bowman. 
he hates side note he hates the nickname the showman really i did see that in the interview they goes yeah he goes um they go how do you like the alex bowman the showman he goes i hate it he goes i don't hmm. know whoever came up with it he goes i don't like it <laughs> so i'm gonna take the 48 of alex bowman all right fair enough so no, it'll be another good race. Keep an eye out uh, for the racing here this weekend. If you're looking to join fantasy, you know, j- definitely join the crew. Uh, happy to join with, join with us. Uh, make your race picks here in the comments too. If if you got somebody else that you're rooting for, or you think is going to win this weekend. Again, we're starting to get to that harder schedule. So we'll start to see what teams got uh, for the rest of the year. So as always, we always uh, are always looking for feedback on our videos. So make sure to like, comment, subscribe on these. We're always looking for support. Check us out on the socials as well. And then as I always say, go to your local short track. Cam, you got something you want to point out? Hey, yeah, let's let's celebrate. Hey, we sniffed two bills. Yes. So anybody yes. That, yes. Anybody that subscribed and watches along and likes our videos, our shorts, our race previews, our um. Hopefully we haven't gone backwards, but anybody that likes, shares our content, comments, tunes in, thank you for subscribing to the channel. Um, again, we've been at this for what, probably seven months now. Um, eh, yeah. Uh, started in about November, or September. Um, so maybe six months. Um, so obviously, thank you to anybody that likes, comments, subscribes, shares our content. Obviously, we're trying to build something special here and unique. And um, this thing's only going to grow as we get into racing season and we're at the track. So um, thank you um, to anybody that is on this journey with us. Yeah, for sure. We're going to just continue to try and grow this thing. And, you know, as we get later in the year and the heart of the season starts up, we hope to see you at the racetrack as well. And that's the best way you can support anybody in racing is to be able to go out to the racetrack and, and watch these guys do what they do for a living as well. So again, always make sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit that bell. So, you know, when our race previews go out, uh, keep an eye out for our next Netflix special, possibly coming out this week, later this week, keep an eye out for that. But until then, we'll see you uh, on next week's episode of the Tuesday track talk. Oh, 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 oh,